As a father of two remarkable children, I can begin to understand the heartache of parents whose children suffer from pediatric craniofacial syndromes and dysmorphologies. That is why one of the most difficult, rewarding, and important areas of plastic surgery is working to heal these children. For that reason today, I will highlight the pediatric craniofacial element of plastic and reconstructive surgery. The January issue is anchored by a CME article that overviews the diagnosis and management of infants and children with craniofacial syndromes. Come join Drs. Forrest and Hopper for a broad overview of these conditions and treatment protocols. We are fortunate today to have our pediatric craniofacial section editor, Dr. Scott Bartlett, with us as well. Scott, what did you find particularly important about this article? Rob, well, this is a great article. It's a terrific article. It's uh, uh, replete with a number of videos and some great graphics and tends to cover all of the major craniofacial syndromes. I think the resident in preparation for his board exams is going to find this of great value. And for the practitioner who sees these patients only occasionally, I think it will be of great help as well. Scott, I couldn't agree more. In using the CME article as our guide, we can now delve even deeper into three specific craniofacial syndromes featured in the January issue. Unicoronal synostosis is a known cause of impaired vision and malalignment of the eye in the ipsilateral orbit. In this paper, the authors use 3D computerized tomography imaging to learn more about orbital dysmorphology in unicoronal synostosis. They had some interesting findings and conclusions, Rod. Not only did they note that the orbit that's involved on the ipsilateral side is affected, but the contralateral orbit may be as well, both volumetrically and and geometrically. This may go away to explain some of the recent findings that the contralateral orbit may be responsible for things such as strabismus and amblyopia in these children. Plagiocephaly is often successfully treated or corrected with helmet therapy only. In this article, the authors studied 346 infants undergoing helmet therapy for plagiocephaly to see if the patient's age at the beginning of treatment affects that success. Indeed, they found that the duration of helmet therapy correlated positively with the age of uh, treatment. In other words, the younger the age of the patient getting treated, the better the result might be. The other thing I found very interesting was the fact that you can get changed in a positive way even beyond the 12th month of age, which has been a debatable issue. Apert syndrome is characterized by bilateral coronal synostosis, midfacial retrusion, and neurodevelopmental delays. In this review of 135 APERT patients over 20 years, Dr. Jeff Furon looks at ways to avoid preventable developmental delays, reduce the total number of operations, and improve treatment paradigms. It was surprising to me that the large number of uh, procedures these patients underwent, 10 on average. It's also interesting to note that the, that the age at which these procedures are initiated may have an effect on the ultimate result and importantly that if there is a con continuity of care in a single center that the improvement in the results can be um, achieved. I think it's also very interesting to note the tracheostomy shunts and these things that we've suspected for a number of years have a negative effect on development do indeed in this surgeon's experience. I hope our discussion of these four articles has given you some insight into this important area of plastic and reconstructive surgery. These courageous, innocent infants and children with craniofacial issues will always have a great ally on their side, plastic and reconstructive surgeons like you.